And so this this specific project that you worked on here that we're interested mm -hmm. in uh, with these novel human genome uh, human genes, how did that uh, originate? Well, it, we came across it actually by accident, really. Um, we were initially interested in a project where we were looking for cases of lineage-specific gene duplication and loss. Because when we talk about you know the differences between the human and the chimp genome, we all know that they're really, really highly similar at the DNA level. Like if you ask anybody in the bus, they tell you you know 99% identical, something like this. And so, what kind of differences are there? There's clever, regulatory clever differences. Clever buses around Trinity. Yeah, <laughs> there's kind of like a you know, but there's, there's regulatory differences, which are definitely really important. But the main idea at the time was that you might have regulatory differences, and then you know sometimes more copies of one gene and another. So this is what we were looking for. But when you're doing this kind of thing, um, you have to kind of be aware of the the data you're using and. And um, the genome sequence data aren't completely perfect. And so if you don't find something, it doesn't mean it's not necessarily there. So we were trying to say, okay, it doesn't look like this gene is there in chimp, but you know, maybe it's there, but they just haven't sequenced it yet. So is there a gap in the region of the genome where we should find the gene? Or you know, is there something there that maybe just hasn't been annotated because they missed it in the initial? So we checked for all these things, and there's this small subset of the genes where we couldn't exclude any of these you know, trivial explanations. The gene didn't appear to be in chimp, but then we couldn't see a sequence gap. We couldn't see an annotation error. And then when we look at the DNA, we see similar DNA, but it's, it's broken we could say, by uh, these disablers in terms of if you try to say, you know, is there a gene there, you could say, well, I can see very, very similar DNA, but there's a, there's a few stop codons in the middle of this, so it can't actually make the protein. Then the stop codons are because of small things like um, small um, insertions or deletions, and um, if they're not a multiple of three, they change the whole protein downstream, or just an actual mutation which creates a stop codon, so a TAG or one of those. And so we could see, you know, we've got these cases, and it's a human gene, and it's definitely not there in chimp. And then we, so we take a kind of broader view in an evolutionary sense. We go, well, look everywhere else we can look, and we can't find it either. And so th this was exciting because we really didn't have it in our mind to look for novel genes because it's not even a thing we expect to find. It's, and then it's, even when you're trying to not look for them, you still, yeah, can't, yeah, yeah. You still can't get rid of this, yeah. this discovery. So yeah, the best science is when, uh, when you can no longer ignore it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that's it. it. Must be true. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had to. We I, we were really the the first um, skeptics that needed to be persuaded because it was this was a lot of work in convincing ourselves to the level that we could say really we can we can stand by this. This is because this is at true. the end of the day you you published a paper and put your name to it, so yeah, you have to yeah. be sure that it's right. Yes, that's yeah, right. that's true. Indeed. So, but obviously all this took time and mm. and resources, computers and things like that. So, how did you get the funding to be able to well, do that? Well, so well, um, this wasn't the project was the, the kind of the gain, gain and loss uh, by duplication, but um, this was funded by Science Foundation Ireland. I got an award from them just over almost five years ago now, I think. Um, it's this President of Ireland uh, Young Researchers Award, so it's trying to help young people set up their group and with ambitious projects. And, um, and so that gave me the funding to hire people in my group, so it paid the stipend and fees for three PhD students and for two postdocs over these uh, four years. And then we also bought our computers and helps us travel to conferences where we can share ideas and learn from other people's ideas. And so this is how that's And, and so then, but the funding is sufficiently flexible that you can find a good observation and yeah, follow it well, up I think as well. Yeah, Science Foundation Ireland are quite uh, good like that, that they recognise that you can't necessarily predict everything that will happen. By definition, we're doing a science project. You don't know the answer before you start. If you knew the answer already, that means the project's already done. Exactly. And so you start out with these goals, but they know that um, if something exciting comes up, that you should follow yeah, it up. And, and uh, so they were they were happy. I'm so how, sure. about the, how about the the person that worked with you on this? The other author on the paper was he interested in it as my well? My student or? David. Yeah, he was a great student. He was actually the first student I ever had in my lab, and so. Um, so he came into this empty lab, it was just me and him, and we're just buying the computers. And he started working, and he was always working really hard, and it was really, yeah, he gave a, he gave a, a talk here within the department, and we were showing the results, and people were interested in it, and he got really excited about it then, and he was really very good, he worked very hard, he was very good at reading the literature around, and finding out things about what was known already, and you know, how can we place this in context. So, so he wasn't so hard to convince. No, no, he was, he's definitely self-motivated, and so that's a... That's a and so what sort of tools do you have in your laboratory to be able to do these sorts of experiments? Um, well, in terms of what we did from the technical point of view, we didn't actually use anything so 
So just, uh, just your laptop that an undergraduate student has could the, do it, or you need more computing power? We didn't need a huge amount. You could probably do it. You could probably almost do it on a laptop. Yeah, we did it on. Because it's one a, of these things that the computers get more and more powerful yeah, so quickly. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. Things that I've done along these lines uh, five years ago that took somebody's cluster can yeah. now be done on my laptop. This, so. this, this was done on a kind of a, a normal yeah. desktop computer. So it was it was a kind of a really good desktop computer. But that's essentially what it was done on. So and in terms of the tools we used, we the principal thing was Blast, which um, your students probably know about mm -hmm. by now and um, so we used BLAST to compare the human proteins against all of the chimp and the macaque and so the first question we asked is what human proteins don't have a hit in chimp and macaque and that's their first simple analysis and that gave us this list of um, it was 644 proteins that no hit in in, in chimp and so that's our initial list and then we the rest of the project was pruning out the ones that had these trivial reasons for not being present like there's a sequencing gap in that and so that meant we just wrote little programs ourselves using Perl and uh, we kind of say okay well the if we got human gene B and so there's A B C human mm -hmm. gene B looks interesting we look we find A and C in chimp and we yep. say what's in between them essentially mm -hmm. and if there's no gap that's already a good start yep. and uh, if there's a gap we say okay maybe it's just not sequenced but then we look at this DNA and we say can we see similarity yes we can so now we know this is the origin this is the ancestral or the orthologous DNA yep. they have a common ancestor um, but what's this what does this DNA look like? And that's when we look to say, okay, is this DNA capable of making a similar protein? Even if nobody's annotated it yet, that's not the problem. Is it potentially capable of making a similar protein? And in the only ones we kept then was where we could say, okay, we found the DNA and we can show you this can't make the protein. And we can do the same in macaque, which is a, a monkey, so it's an yeah. earlier diverging lineage. So we can infer that then these were uh, ancestrally not making a protein. Yeah. And it's only now in human that, that we make a protein so, from this DNA. Yeah. So the but the programming aspect of mm -hmm. it was really is just saving you from having to make all of the mouse clicks because if yeah. you've got six hundred and forty four proteins yeah, yeah. you ended up with three in the end and so therefore you wouldn't yeah. want to have to go through six hundred and forty four of them it's with your two mouse. things. It's also that um, humans are more error prone. So as soon as I've got any time I've had to do something like do ten blast searches, let's say, and I run one and then I've got to save it with the meaningful file name so I don't get mixed up about which search was that, what were the parameters I put in. Um, if you tell your computer to run the ten blast search and so I'd name it with the sequence query name and then put an underscore and the parameters, yep. it's gonna do it right every time and it's never gonna make the mistake. And so um, that's another thing the we are error prone and we get tired and yep. and so this yeah, so in terms of um well, yeah, so we go to the pub things. on a Friday. Yes, then. yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the programs we wrote in this particular case were all things you could have done by hand. Mm -hmm. Um but they would have been really laborious and time consuming and all these kind of things. Okay. But you could have done them. There was nothing that you and if you nothing that you say you it was like a so so sophisticated a calculation that you needed a supercomputer and computer. Okay. okay. And then the maths and the stats that were involved in the validation of these things. Yeah. There were there wasn't anything too hard for No, especially hard. in this particular paper, yes. Mm -hmm. I've had other papers where there's been more, but essentially um the like when it, so I suppose the the kind of the bread and butter statistics of the type of work we do would be things like a chi square test you know is this different from an expectation and there's another one a z score you know so you so you've got something is could a distribution yeah the distribution, uh, distribution of differences, of differences. Yeah.